Hello there. Welcome to the video that will cover the review sheet for uh, CHM 136 General Chemistry 2 at your College of Pennsylvania in preparation for exam 2. Uh, so you should have your review sheets handy. It was the three page packet that I handed out in uh, the lecture for you. I'm going to work through all of the problems. That's 26 questions and give you the, uh, the answers or the solutions as needed. And I'll also uh, be dropping some information about the exam uh, throughout the, the video or so. My hope is that it will take about uh, 50 minutes to an hour at most to, to cover all this material, much like a, a class would, uh, would take. Feel free to take breaks if you need to and rewind. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can always watch me solve something again and again and again uh, with this wonderful uh, technology that we have available. Okay. I've got the first three problems up on the board, and so let's just get right to it. Our first question asks us to find the rate law of a reaction that involves two reactants, A and B. And we're given three sets of data. This is data that is part of what we call the method of initial rates. Someone has studied this reaction three separate times, controlling the concentrations to see their effects on the rate over here. And as we see, we've got three different rates going on here. If we look at our pairings, though, trials one and two, A stayed the same, but B is what changed. We can conclude then that it, it's whatever we changed about B that caused the change in the initial rate then. And then trials two and three, B was held constant, so it would no longer contribute to a change in the rate, but A was allowed to change. And so the change in the rate here is due to A. And that's how we can infer the order of each of these reactants. If you're a person who can do this by inspection, you may quickly note that um, for this pairing, uh, trials one and two, when the concentration doubled, the rate also doubled. That means that B is first order, but we'll prove it mathematically in a second. Okay? Uh, on the other hand, in trials two and three, when A doubled, the rate quadrupled. So this effect here, or this cause, if you want to call it that, of having a, a change of factor of two, led to a change of a factor of 4 in the rate. So that is 2 squared, so we know that A is going to be second order. So that's by inspection, if you can do it that way. Right? Uh, the traditional way to find these, though, if you can't do it by inspection, is to substitute a line or multiple lines into your generic rate law. The rate law of this reaction would start with the rate being equal to some rate constant, which we don't know yet, times the concentration of A raised to an order, times the concentration of B raised to an order. And so if I take trial two divided by trial one, what will happen is, because A is constant, it's going to drop out, and so will the K, and I'll be able to see mathematically the order of B, for example, okay? So trial two, divided by trial 1, the rate for trial 2 is the 1.78 times 10 to the negative 5 equals K times A's concentration, 0.25 to its X times B concentration, 0.3 to the Y. Dividing that by trial 1, 8.9 times 10 to the minus 6 equals K times 0.25 to the x times 0.15 to the y. So uh, the reason I've put trial 2 over trial 1 is so that this number right here comes out to be a number bigger than 1. And it looks like it comes out to just about 2, almost exactly. So if you're rounding, it would be 2. The k's will cancel out. Regardless of what x is, I don't know what it is yet, 0.25 raised to it is the same in each case. So all we're left with is 0.3 divided by 0.15. That simplifies to 2 raised to the y power. It's 
been a while since I posed you questions like this, but if you read this sentence in English, it's a question saying, two is two raised to what power? That power, of course, is one. And so this is the order of B. We've just proven what I, I uh, said by the method of initial rate, sorry, inspection up here earlier. Now we gotta do this over for trials two and three. Trial three has the larger rate, so I'll put it in the numerator and divide by trial two. So now 7.12 times 10 to the negative five equals K times concentration of A, 0.5 to the X, concentration of B, 0.3 to the Y. Divided by 1.78 times 10 to the negative five equals K times 0.5. 2.5 to the x and 0.3 to the y. This time, because we held b constant for these two trials, the b drops out, okay, the k's again drop out. This is really, really close to 4, rounding it to a whole number, and we get 2 to the x power. Now our question is 4 is 2 raised to what power? So you think about the powers of two, it's the second power of two, or the square, that gives you, uh, that makes that statement true. So A, because X represents the order of A, is second order. To complete the rate law, we need to come up with the rate constant. So if we could try this for any one of our trials, it wouldn't really matter. So for trial one, we would plug in 8.90 times 10 to the minus sixth now that's molar per second, those are the units of rate, equals K times the concentration of A, 0.25 squared now, times the concentration of B, 0.15. Now each of these are molarity, molarity. So this gets molarity squared, and when you divide these numbers over to the left side, you end up with 9.47 times 10 to the minus 4, and the units, because you're going to have molarity cubed total from this being squared and that, canceling out, you get 1 over molarity squared seconds. So now you finish it all off, put all your pieces together, the rate law for this reaction, its rate will equal 9.47 times 10 to the minus 4, 1 over molar squared seconds, times the concentration of A squared, times the concentration of B raised to the first power. Now, any other trial you try in the future, if you know your concentrations of A and B, you would plug those specific numbers in here, to these placeholders, and that would tell you how fast that reaction is going to go. Right. Our second question asks us to identify the units of the rate constant given this rate law. It's a slightly different way to see a rate law. This, this, the trick here is recognizing that because this is a reaction, A going to B, this delta B over delta T, that would be the rate of this reaction. Okay? This is the way we express the average rate of the reaction. So we're saying the rate of this reaction is equal to K times A, and it's not written up here, but that means this is a first order reaction. So what are the units of a first order reaction's rate constant is what this question is really asking. Well, rate units are always molarity per ton. Concentration is always molarity. That means that the K must provide the one over time. So the units of K are one over seconds for a first order reaction. That's all you need to do there. Okay. Our third question says we have a, a reaction that is first order and we're told it has a half-life of 2.36 hours. If the initial concentration is 0.52 molar, what is the concentration of the reactant after 752 seconds? All right, to solve this problem, leave a little bit of space here first. To solve this problem, because it's a first order reaction, we'll use ln of, I'll just use a generic 
x as my reactant here equals ln of the initial concentration minus kt. I am told how much time we're interested in here. I'm also given the initial concentration. What I'm lacking is the rate constant. So that rate constant is going to come from this half-life information that we have. So we have an equation that tells us that the half-life of a first-order reaction is ln of 2 divided by the rate constant. Therefore, the rate constant is the ln of 2 divided by the half-life. So when I take ln of 2 divided by, now I'm going to convert this 2.36 hours into seconds. I'm doing that now, just so you know, you don't have to, but I'm doing it now because later on my time is also in seconds. So somewhere a conversion's got to be done. So I'm just going to do it at this position rather than converting seconds to hours later on. Okay. It would be the same answer either way. So the ln of 2 divided by uh, the half-life in seconds gives us a k of 8.15 times 10 to the negative 5. And that's 1 over seconds as its units there. I can now bring that number down here and solve for my concentration. So we would have the ln of our initial concentration, 0.52, minus 8.15 times 10 to the negative 5, 1 over seconds, times the 752 seconds. So my values here, ln of 0.52, minus 8.15 times 10 to the negative 5 times 752 give me a negative 0.715. Now, of course, this is not our answer because our left side doesn't say concentration. Our left side says this value is the ln of our concentration. And that makes a lot of sense because we know concentration can never be negative. The minimum concentration you could ever have is zero. So to get the concentration, we need E, which is the inverse function of ln, to the negative 0.715. And that gives us our answer of 0.49 molar, which is not too much less than our uh, starting concentration but it is less than our starting concentration, so that's good news because we know it's always going to be decreasing the reacting concentration. Right? So those are our first three problems that we have. Our next couple of questions continue with uh, the kinetics information. Question four, we have another first order reaction. We're given the rate constant. We want to calculate the original concentration um, if we're given the concentration after 209 seconds. So again, because this is a first order reaction, the ln of the concentration, so we might as well go ahead and use N205, equals the ln of the initial concentration minus kt. So we have ln of 0.41 molar equals ln of our unknown, at this point, starting concentration, minus the rate constant, 5.8 times 10 to the negative 3 reciprocal seconds, and 209 seconds. So we will add this term over to the left side, ln of 0.41 plus 5.8 times 10 to the negative 3 times 209 gives us 0 0.321. Again, we're not done just yet, because read that says that's the ln of the initial concentration, 
So the initial concentration would be E raised to the 0.321. or 1.38 uh, or 1.4 molar, okay? And uh, the only real hint that you get is it does need to be greater than the value that you have in this case. So that's another hint that the 0.32 is wrong because 0.41 is how much was left after 209 seconds. So this question asked how much did you start with so obviously, you have to start with more than 0.41 molar. Our fifth question moves on to a second order reaction. So we have a different integrated rate law that governs the behavior of second order reactions. This time, we have reactant generic A. Initial concentration, 0.24. Given the rate constant, what's the concentration after 265 seconds? So for a second order reaction, this is number five that I'm working on now, one over the concentration of A equals one over the initial concentration of A plus KT. So if we plug in what we know, one over the initial 0.24 molar plus K 5.5 times 10 to the minus 3. It says reciprocal molar, reciprocal second, so 1 over molar and second, times 265 seconds. So when I add my 1 over 0.24 plus this product, I get 5.62. Again, that's not the answer, because the answer on the left side, symbolically, is not concentration yet, it's 1 over. So to get the concentration, I'm raising both sides to the negative 1, I'm taking the reciprocal of both sides. So 5.62 raised to the negative 1 power gives me 0 0.18. Again, there's an answer now that is less than my starting concentration, but greater than 0. So it's falling in that window defined by the starting concentration at the upper limit and the zero as the, the lower limit. Question six moves into, uh, still in kinetics, into covering some information about mechanisms. So we have a mechanism proposed, NO plus N2O. So our first step produces an N2 plus an NO2, and our second step is that two NO2s decompose, or react, sorry, to make two NO plus O2. Two questions here. What is our overall reaction, and which species is the catalyst? So to find the overall reaction, we add these two canceling out anything that appears on both the left and the right side of the reaction. Now this one's a little sneaky in some regards <clears throat> because we have one NO here and two NOs in the second step. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it'll cross off completely on the left but not entirely on the right. We will be left with one unit of NO on the right. The same thing is true for our NO2s. We have one on the right and two on the left. So again, one of those will cancel out. So now when we drop this down, pull everything down, we have an NO2 remaining from this step plus an N2O from the first step. And then we have an N2, an O2, and one NO. It's always helpful to double check that your reaction is balanced. That's an indication that you've done something correctly. If it's not balanced, you know you've made a mistake somewhere. So I have one, two, three atoms of nitrogen on the left, two, three atoms of oxygen on the left. On the right, I have two atoms plus one, three of nitrogen, two plus one, three of oxygen. So it's all balanced. The second part of this question was identify a catalyst. So catalysts are materials that are added in 
in one step of your reaction. They're basically folded into the reaction process, and then they're reformed in a, a later step. So that would apply to the NO in this case, that it's the catalyst. Now this catalyst is a little bit unique, okay? Um, I doubt I would put something like this on your exam, to be honest, because it's unique in that you did have to add this, it gets remade in a later step, but it actually gets remade in a larger quantity than you add. So this is kind of making more of your catalyst, as it turns out, in this reaction. But this is considered a catalyst because of the way it cancels out there. Okay? Um, and NO2 is, again, a little sneaky here, it's a sneaky mechanism I've given you here, because only part of it cancels out. It looks like an intermediate product, but it's not really an entirely an intermediate product because we, we do have to add some NO2, even though the system makes some of its own in the process. Question seven has another uh, mechanism involved with it. So uh, let's look at the three steps involved in this mechanism. Two and O are gonna form an N2O2. Our second step is that N2O2 plus H2 forms an N2O plus H2O, and our third step is that an N2O plus another H2 forms an N2 plus an H2O. Okay. The questions associated with this mechanism are, if the first step is the slowest, what can you conclude about the order of the overall reaction? I'll answer that one second, actually. And then the second question is, identify any intermediates. So the intermediates would be the things that cancel out. But we actually don't have to write the overall reaction to do that. We can just look at what cancels out. Clearly, this N2O2 from the first step cancels out. It's an intermediate. It is formed in step one and then eliminated as a reactant in step two. An N2O also falls into that category, formed in step two, eliminated in step three as a reactant. So those are your two intermediate products, the two that we've crossed out. If you balance this, if you want to come up with what the overall reaction is, it looks like 2NO plus 2H2 forms um, N2 plus 2H2O. Double check that it's balanced. Two nitrogens, two nitrogens. Two oxygens, two oxygens. Four hydrogens, four hydrogens. It is a balanced equation. Now let's talk about the kinetics. Because mechanisms are where we really learn about the rate laws of a reaction. So each of these steps has its own rate law. And one of the rules about a mechanism is that one of the steps tells us about the overall process the slowest of those steps. Okay? So we're told that the first step is the slowest. So this is what we call the rate determining step of our mechanism. Uh, a different way of getting that information would be an, an activation energy diagram, or sorry, a reaction coordinate diagram, is what we call them, where we see a plot of the energy during the process, progress of this reaction. So our first step would have that biggest energy hill or barrier to climb. But what that means is each of these steps is an elementary step. And what is unique about elementary steps involving only one or two particles is their rate laws come directly from the coefficients of the reactions, of their reactions. So for this first step, I know the rate law is second order with respect to the NO because its coefficient is 2. So, and this is also the rate governing step for the entire process. So that's going to propagate telling me that the overall reaction down here is second order with, respi with respect to the nitrogen monoxide. Okay? Uh, that's how we can uh, infer the overall rate law of a mechanism. Uh, for, for a reaction from the various steps of its mechanism. Okay. 
And then these hydrogens get added later on in very fast steps. So they're not going to be in any way impacting the rate of the reaction. Uh, it wouldn't matter how much hydrogen you put in there, you're not going to make the reaction go faster because it hinges on this slow step, which only involves nitrogen monoxide. So I can conclude that the reaction's zero order with respect to the hydrogen because those steps are faster than the first step of this mechanism. Okay? That's a little bit more of an advanced idea, but that's why we dig into mechanisms, is to learn as much as we can about the rate loss of our reactions. All right, those first seven questions then, we're all from chapter 13. And they jumped around covering a variety of things in chapter 13. On the exam, I want to let you know that uh, chapter 13 accounts for eight of the 20 multiple choice questions that I've put on the exam. So it'll begin with 20 multiple choice questions, eight of which come from chapter 13. Um, and they you know, cover a variety of, of topics in chapter 13. Things from that chapter that lend themselves to quick multiple choice questions would be um, if you just see a rate law saying what's the order of a particular reactant, okay, or the overall order of the reaction. If you see a rate law, what are the units of the rate constant for that uh, rate law? So you're trying to, again, figure out what the order is. Uh, so if we saw rate equals K N O squared, the multiple choice question might be, what are the units of K for this reaction? You saw it was second order, that tells you the units need to be one over molarity and seconds. That's, that's the type of question that I'm interested in, all right? Uh, and so they should be pretty straightforward questions uh, about uh, what's going on with, uh, with rate laws in uh, chapter 13, okay? Um, there will also be three problems from chapter 13 on the exam where you'll show your work and, and be able to earn partial credit on, on those problems. Um, each of the multiple choice questions, by the way, is worth two points total. So that's uh, 40 points for all 20 multiple choice questions. Okay? The problems are going to be six or seven points on average on the exam. And so the chapter 13 problems, uh, the things that I'm interested in seeing you show me work, because you might make a mistake here or there, and, you know, just uh, earn a little bit of a deduction rather than getting the entire thing wrong. Um, method of initial rates that we did, um, any of the integrated rate law problems, finding a concentration after a particular amount of time, all right, or finding a, a certain amount of time for the concentration to be reduced to a particular value, all right. Um, so those are the types of things that will be covered in the problems uh, of chapter, associated with chapter 13, okay. Uh, any questions about mechanisms would probably uh, be more uh, uh, related to the multiple choice questions as I think back about, about those. Okay. All right, let's move on on the review sheet to the questions that relate to chapter 14. So picking up uh, with question number 8. Question 8 asks us to write the equilibrium constant Kc, so that's concentration based, for this reaction. Copper, 2 plus ions, plus 4 ammonia and 